Hey guys, welcome to LPMSA. Here we got Freddie. I known him since freshman year. He was a great mentor, um, a really great person to talk to, and now he's in medical school. So um, ask him any questions that you'd like to be, you'd like answered, and yeah, you can take it away, Freddie. All right, cool. Uh, hey everybody, I'm Freddie. Uh, I'm an M2 right now at uh, the UIC uh, Medical School. I'm gonna try to like put like a cohesive story together for y'all and then I'll try to make it brief. And then that way I'll, uh, I'll just open up to Q and A's and maybe that'll probably work a little better. Uh, and if no nobody has like too many questions, I'll just start diving into like kind of some things that I feel like are important uh, about being a pre-med and then how in medical school as well. So uh, my journey into medicine was kind of a long process. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, as far as a career, uh, I went, I basically worked full time since I was uh, like 16. Uh, up until like I started med school, I had like maybe like a year or two off in between that. And so uh, for me, it was kind of just uh, I'm going to school, I'm working full time, so it was a little bit, it was a little bit rough. Uh, I did, I did start doing some volunteering uh, in the hospital, just kind of like looking for like a path of like you know trying to find something. Uh, but I've always been interested in just kind of helping uh, my my community. I grew up in the Logan Square, Humble Park neighborhoods. I don't know if uh, many are familiar with that. Those areas, they're kind of like in the north side, northwest side of Chicago. Uh, and so I've, I've always been interested in, in, you know, helping like people within my community. And so it kind of like sparked a little bit of an interest in medicine. Um, and so most of the things that I did during undergrad was just really just work. <laughs> and then, uh, what was that? Thank you. Oh, I think someone was unmuted. Uh, it's all good. So uh, that's kind of like, I, I just, like I said, uh, it was really just about helping people like other people like me. And then uh, I kind of got interested in medicine, started doing some uh, volunteering uh, at the hospital. Uh, and so I pretty much started, was working most of the time until like uh, sometime between my like senior year, when I was about ready to graduate, I kind of had to like focus in on grades because I realized that medicine was what I wanted to do. And I wanted to get my grades up and start doing research, uh, all those things that I can talk about if anybody has any specific questions. Uh, but really, that was kind of my path towards medicine, and uh, I just applied to UIC. What ended up happening was um, I actually uh, found out that I had a baby on the way, so I applied to. I had to apply to UIC specifically just because I had to stay in the area, uh, even though I was uh, originally going to apply to like uh, 15, 30 schools, but that didn't end up working out. So I had to really uh, pretty much only apply to UIC because that's what I had to do to stay here. And then now I'm a current uh, M2 and I'm studying for STEP currently. So if anybody has any questions, just go ahead and just shout them out. I can talk about the MCAT process, what UIC's curriculum was like, what you, uh, uh, as an undergrad, I can talk about uh, the med school curriculum, what that's like, what STEP studying is like, uh, anything that anybody like is interested in hearing about. Can you talk more about, um like your timeline for studying for the MCAT and what resources you used? Sure, yeah, so uh, the way it worked was, so I took a gap year. Well, I technically took two gap years because like I graduated and then I took that gap year, but as you all know, like the way you apply, you apply like one year in advance. Uh, so what I did was like, I basically did, was doing research and uh, under Aixa Alfonso's lab for about a year. And then the way it worked for me was like around January, I was working uh, and I, I started like studying kind of like part-time. The way, what I did was like, I started doing content review because the last time I took physics before I took the MCAT was like really like, was like a pretty big gap, like three, four years. And so like a lot of the stuff I had forgotten, so I needed to review. So I started with content review around like January, although I was working so full-time. So it was a little bit tough to like, kind of like, uh, you know, put it like putting many hours into the MCAT. Uh, so I would say in a week, I was probably studying like maybe 10 to 20 hours a week. Uh, and I had scheduled an exam date for May. So from January, roughly up until like, let's say like mid-March, I was studying maybe 10 to 20 hours a week, just reviewing content, like relearning physics, relearning organic chemistry, psych, social, all the things that are like, you know, part of like the MCAT. And then what I did was like, I. I told my job, I was like, okay, look, I have to study for the MCAT uh, full time now because it was like, I started to feel the pressure. I was like, I felt like I still had a lot to, to review and my exam was coming up. Uh, it was like, it was like mid May, if I'm not mistaken. And so I, I wanted to get it in. I wanted to get it done between, uh, I wanted to basically be done with the MCAT 
by mid-May because you, you, if you don't know, the MCAT takes about a month for you to get your score back. And applications generally open up around like beginning of uh, June. So usually what you want to do is you want to make sure that you get an MCAT score back and ready so you can apply around like June. Uh, you can push it like late June as well, but it really kind of depends on like a little bit of your timeline. Usually what re what's recommended is like you want to have an MCAT score in by like the application cycle when it opens so you can apply almost immediately because they do go based on rolling admissions. Uh, so uh, definitely don't do what I did as far as MCAT studying. I crammed a lot of stuff like in that, those last, that last month and a half because I was just working and then I, I didn't put in as much time uh, prior to that. And so I crammed the MCAT like really, really studying, like doing practice questions, doing practice exams in about a month and a half. But I definitely do not recommend uh, anybody does that. Give yourself three months. And if it's okay if you need six months, there's like nothing wrong with that. If you need like, uh, if you need six months, totally fine. Take, take it at your, your pace because I was burning, I burned out pretty bad, like towards like, uh, as I was getting ready to take my exam, basically because I was studying like 20, 10, 12 hours a day, because I try to cram everything in the last month and a half. Bad idea, definitely don't do that. Uh, one thing that I also strongly recommend and advice uh, uh, you don't do is don't force it. If you're like scoring, like, I don't know, like sub 500, or maybe if, even if it's not sub 500, if it's not like worth the score that you want, you know, let's say like your, your, your score or, you know, your, your target score is like 510, 515 or 505, whatever it may be. If you're not scoring that in your practice exams, don't force it uh, and think because like this, it really, it really serves no benefit because if, if you get that bad score, you're just gonna have to retake it again. So what's the point of taking one to begin with? You know what I mean? You can just take a practice exam and, you know, it's not going to be on your, you know, on your transcript or it's not going to be in your record. And that does stay in your record, uh, the MCAT score. Uh, although if you do like score better the second time around, it does look, uh, it looks good, but you just want to show that you have good uh, judgment to the admissions committee and be like, okay, well, they took it when they're ready and they didn't have to take it like two or three times. So, you know, it's okay if you do that, but it's just, you do have to end up scoring high, but it's, it's better to just, you know, take it when you're ready. Don't force it. Even if you have to delay a year. Uh, and the reason I say that is because uh, I've known people that, you know, they'll force it, they won't get the score they want, they'll apply because like, oh, I want to, I just want to apply already. Like, oh, I'm getting older or like, you know, I'm, I don't know, I'm 25, I'm 24, I'm 27, whatever it is, I want to start already. Uh, but it really serves no benefit because if you don't score where you want to be and you don't get accepted, then you have to reapply anyway, you're waiting a year anyway. So the idea is that, you know, take the exam when you're ready and comfortable and your practice scores are in the range where you want it to be and also apply when you're ready. Well, you want to have your strongest application forward. Don't rush it because then like you're just kind of minimizing your chances of getting accepted into medical school. So that would be my advice. Don't rush it. Don't rush the application process. A year may seem like a lot. I know because I was thinking I was thinking the same thing, but it's better to wait that year and get accepted than to not get accepted and then have to reapply again because you, you know at the end of the day, you, you know, you apply again. Uh, as far as my content, um, do y'all do want like specifics about what I did, what research? I know you did mention resources, but I did also say a lot right now. Yeah, could you go in deeper to the content? I know this is like relevant for me, at least for me and Elizabeth, just because we were both studying for the MCAT. Gotcha. And um, I mean, for me personally, like the bio, biochem section is like the, my most difficult, while cars surprisingly is my highest for some reason. Hey, but nice. like, but yeah, it's mainly bio, biochem. So do you have strategies on, on that section? Yeah, hundred uh, percent. I do want to uh, preface this by saying that uh, I also made a document uh, that I share with a lot of other pre-meds to kind of break down each individual section, the way I approached it. Uh, and I also kind of made a list that I personally thought was kind of like the strong suits of each company. So uh, as all you know, there's Kaplan, there's a Princeton review, there's even the Berkeley review, which is kind of more like practice questions. Uh, there's U World that I highly recommend everybody uh, gets access to. Um, um, the good thing I do want to say, but you said about cars, a lot of people struggle with that. If it comes to you naturally, that's great. Every other section you can work on if with sheer, like basically practice problems and doing, you can, you can increase those scores. Cars is kind of like a little bit more difficult, but you can, we can talk about that later. Uh, so that's good news. Uh, as far as the resources that I use, so I use specifically Kaplan for biochemistry and for biology, I used exam crackers. Uh, I don't know if you all know, but exam crackers is more of a, uh, it's kind of more concise. So if you're a biology major, I would recommend you do, you start with exam crackers because it's pretty much like, kind of like, it's just 
very small summaries. Don't go too much in depth because those are stuff that you probably already know. Same thing with chemistry, same thing with physics. If you're strong in like certain areas, I would start with exam crackers because they're more concise and they're quicker to get to. You wanna, sp you wanna be as, very, as efficient as possible during your content review because the most important part for MCAT studying is doing a lot of practice questions and a lot of practice exams so because that they emulate like what the exam is like. You know, you can know, I don't know, you can know Avogadro's number all you want, but they're gonna apply it in a different way and ask it to you a certain way in, you know, MCAT questions. Uh, so that's something that you uh, get out of practicing. Now, the thing about, and I mentioned this in my document and I, I'll, 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 I'll type in my email right now actually, and anybody that wants to like, have access to that document or just wants to ask me questions, uh, you know, through email, whatever have you, through another form of communication, uh, definitely feel free to email me and I'll reach out. But as far as uh, biochemistry and biology, so the, the second section, right? no, wait, is this the third section, right? Yeah, so that's the third section. The way they do it is that they basically just have you, there's two types of questions. There's the discrete, which are just kind of, you either know it or you don't. They don't generally have passages associated with them. Uh, they're just kind of like questions like, oh, I don't know, what does like, what's GFR in the kidney? You know what I mean? Stuff, something like that. You just kind of got to know it. And then there's only, there's like a, there's a specific number of those. And I have it in my document. I can't remember at the top of my head, but they're about like, I think they're about like 10 or so like per, per section. Uh, the other sections are basically just kind of scientific literature, scientific articles that they give you like a lot of information about and you just kind of got to read a passage and you get like about like three or four questions roughly uh, per passage. Uh, I don't know how many of you have taken it, but that's generally the outline that they have for biology and biochemistry. And so the thing that sucks about that section is that like unlike chemistry and physics, you kind of have to get a, uh, you kind of have to read the, the, the entire passage and get a, get a good understanding. Uh, my recommendation would be to not get too caught up in like all the little details. You, as you do more and more practice questions, you start to realize like, oh, this is the important concept that they, they're testing me on. This is like, you know, this is what they want me to focus on. They'll throw in a lot of convoluted like pathways and stuff like that. And a lot of times it won't be like super relevant, especially for chemistry and physics. But for biology and biochemistry, you do got to understand it a little bit more, but don't get too caught up in like all the, de all the details. Make sure you get a good gist, good something like a rough understanding of the article of the passage they're trying to uh, help you read. Oh, I mean, not help you read, but that they put on there and then like, then you start answering questions. Now, the thing that helped me a lot, uh, raise my score a lot in that section was a really strong in like understanding of like uh, the basics when it comes to independent variable, uh, the control and um, dependent variables. Because most of the, a lot of the questions that they ask you kind of revolve around those things. It's like, okay, like, you know, they give you a sci scientific, like, you know, article, and then you have to read it, understand it, and then they'll ask you, what happens to the independent variable when I change this, like, you know, when I change this factor in this, in this scientific experiment? And you got to know, like, oh, well, this is going to happen and how that's represented in a graph, if that makes any sense. Um, now, I can't really like, you know, I, I can talk for a long time about how to like, you know, get stronger at that, but my recommendation would be do a lot of practice questions. And then there's a really helpful YouTube video online uh, that this one, uh, this that, that I had watched, there was a, uh, some guy broke it down to me like that. Like, but this is how you like get better at interpreting like what happens when the dependent variable or to the dependent variable, what happens when they change, you know, like the control or something like that, you know? And then they actually break down like specific double AMC questions. So then that way, you know, like, oh, this is how the double AMC likes to ask questions. And you know, what I mean? so I would recommend you watch that video. Again, it's in my document that I wrote, like, and I usually uh, give it to a lot of other pre-med students. Uh, I recommend you watch that. So you get up, I guess, a more intuitive understanding of what like those biology and biochemistry sections are like. Now, it's, that's kind of like a rough, of you know, just the books that I used. I use Kaplan uh, for biochemistry again, and exam crackers for biology because I was a biology major, so I didn't need too much, um, you know, review for that. Uh, now, as far as the actual resources for practice questions, uh, I don't know how many of you have y'all heard of UWorld. Okay, yes, that's great. That's I'm great. That, I'm glad that you all heard of that. That's great. That's what I'm actually using for Step. It's kind of like the, it's the gold standard when it comes to like medicine. They're really good at making questions and their explanations are top notch. So my uh, recommend, they basically kind of like plagiarize like what the AAMC does. Obviously they're not the same questions, but the fact that they do, aside from cars, they do a really good job of emulating what those uh, 
double AMC question writers like to, you know, what topics they like to do and kind of how like they like to ask the questions. So that's going to be the second best resource for you to get a good understanding of what the MCAT questions are going to be like on exam test day. Obviously, the number one resource uh, that you will get, it's going to be the double AMC and the double AMC has a package of uh, a section bank and they also have a just a question package, which is just uh, um, they're a little bit different. The section bank's a little bit tougher. Uh, in my in my experience, the section bank from Double AMC was probably mimicked some of the hardest questions that I saw in the MCAT, and then the question packs mimicked some of the easier. So the MCAT was kind of like a mix between section bank and uh, question packs, and they were very similar. So Double AMC question, you know, questions. That's what you're gonna want to do. You want to make sure you complete all of them. You don't have to complete all of U World, although if like you're shooting for a really high score, I, you would, I probably want to complete all of U World and all of. But even if, um, so that's uh, as far as uh, double AMC material, and then obviously, uh, if I'm sure you all know, there's uh, four full length practice exams. Uh, those you want to do all of those as well, and you want to review them really well. Um, I can talk a little bit more about that, but I have been talking for a bit. So uh, let me know if you all have any other specific questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, what up, Zoe? Uh, so I don't know what, I don't know too much about uh, Cairo school, to be honest with you, but I, uh, I assume a lot of the similar things from medical school apply. Uh, so uh, Zoe is asking, uh, congrats on your journey. Thank you, by the way. I'm currently applying to Cairo School. What would you say are the most important points in writing personal statements? I think one of the most important things is you want to have like a story. You want to have a cohesive story. Uh, and the, the strongest part of that is your activity section. So for example, like let's say I, my main thing, at least for me, like my main thing was helping other people of color, helping other minorities in my community because the way I grew up was basically around people of color. And so I, I knew the different health disparities that existed within my community and I wrote about that. But if my application with my personal statement was that and my activities was just me volunteering at a hospital and nothing else, like, you know what I mean? They're gonna be like, okay, well that's BS. Like, you know, you're just saying that, you know, uh, the way you know my activity section had uh working in humble park you know working with at-risk at youth i was a football coach uh for two or three years over there and like you know so i, I you know i also volunteered in little village uh which is you know a uh, predominantly latinx community and i did like a lot of health disparity uh work over there i also did some work with after school matters which is again uh an organization i'm sure some of y'all know that uh, aimed at helping people of color as well. And so I also worked at Las Ganas as Juan and uh, Zo know as well, which is kind of just a uh, STEM-based program at UIC, again, helping predominantly like Latinx. And so that was a lot of my, the work that I did was really revolved around helping people of color and trying to help uh, bridge some of these healthcare disparities. And I talked about it in my personal statement. So you wanna make sure that the story in the, that you have matches with your activity section or any like you know these are doctors these are phds they're going to read that and they're going to be like oh this is bs you know you're just saying stuff but where's the work so that would be my recommendations oh and i'm and the thing that's uh, very important that i do want to emphasize to everybody here is that the truth of the matter is that there is not a lot of people of color in medicine it's predominantly as you probably all know uh not it's it's white people and that's the majority and so we are underrepresented in medicine and a lot of schools understand that, uh, and many of them do a lot of work to try to get people of color in, uh, but you have to play your part as well. So it actually does serve as a benefit uh, to us because if you're a person of color, a lot of the times, like, you know, your stats don't have to be as great. And I don't wanna say that as like, I wanna be careful about the way I say that because I don't mean like, oh, apply like with the worst stats. No, that, that's not what it means. It's, it's that, you know, a lot of research has been done that shows that, you know, we have a lot of different barriers that we have to overcome that other people don't. And so that's generally why uh, people of color can sometimes have lower stats and still have a, a good, a, a better, a good chance to get into medical school. But, you know, for example, for me, I didn't have like, I wasn't like a 4.0, like 528, obviously MCAT score or nothing like that. But, you know, I, when I applied, I had like, I think I had like $10,000 hours of work from working full time. And so that's one of the things that I talked about because like, I'm like, okay, well, I'm working full time. It was a little bit difficult to, you know, focus on school. And so the reason I bring all of these things up is because um, you can use that to your advantage and 100% use it. 
being an underrepresented minority, which is which is what they you know the term that they use when you're applying uh, through MCAS application, um, you can use that as your advantage because they are looking for people of color, and that's the reality because they want more people of color. So they you know they they have their selfish reasons as well because they want you know they want to improve like the you know when they say hey we got representation in our medical school, and that's the reality. Uh, and if the way you can use that to your benefit is like okay if you're you're a person of color you want to you know you want to improve representation in the field which is a lot of the uh, you know you you have to be able to talk about that passionately and you got to show that through your activity section you know so you know work with people of color work in you know in, in you know your communities and you know show that you care show that it's something with, that you want to do again like i said i did a lot of work in little village a lot of work in humble park in kind of these at-risk areas because that's you know that's where i was from those are you know that's part of my community and I use that to talk about it in my personal statement. And that's something that uh, you would want to do as well. So if that's something that you have, I, uh, like Zoe, and it, again, it's not too late to do a lot of these things. It's, it's something that I would keep in mind when you're applying for medical school, because you know, you know, being on rep representation in medicine is very important. And a lot of these schools are looking for that. And you, know, you, you also got to put in your part to show that you do want to do this type of work, so. I hope that came across the right way, you know, like the, the, the point was made, but, you know, uh, I don't I don't shy away from it. You know, that's the reality. We are placed at a disadvantage advantage, and that's the way that's what the research shows and definitely use it to your advantage. Definitely. I hope that answered your question. Honestly, I don't know if I just went on a tangent there, but hopefully that <laughs> you would understand that. Could you like, I know you briefly mentioned your gap year, but like, can you like go more into like what exactly you did like during that year? And like, if they asked you about that in your, like when you had your interviews? Sure. So uh, no, they didn't ask about that really because, so I don't remember the exact statistics, but I do believe when I applied, it was about 48% of the matriculants uh, took over uh, one, one or two gap years. Uh, and I can only imagine that number is rising for like a variety of different reasons. So it's very common to take a gap year uh, nowadays. And so I wasn't really asked about it much. So one thing that I would say about that, it is not a detriment to your application. It's, if anything, it's a benefit because of all the time that you, that you can use to strengthen your application during that year. As far as what I did, uh, I basically, I, since, like I said, throughout college, I was basically working full time. And it was a little bit difficult for me to do a lot of the things that I wanted to do. But right towards the end of my senior year, I decided to take out loans and stop working and focus pretty much like on my academics and do all my extracurriculars. And that transitioned over into my, uh, my gap years. So what I ended up doing during those gap years was, uh, you know, did a lot of the stuff that I mentioned before that like I didn't have time for before. Like I was coaching Little League football. I signed up for that and I was in my neighborhood. And so I did, that's one of the things I did. I worked with Enlace. I don't know if anybody knows what Enlace is uh, in Little Village, but that's one of the other things that I did. Again, I worked with After School Matters, so, uh, and I continued doing uh, clinical work as well uh, at Rush. Uh, well, it wasn't clinical, it was clinical volunteering, sorry, at Rush. And so really what I did during those years was try to strengthen my application because I, need, I knew I needed work in some of these areas. And um, the other thing that I did was I, did, I started research. Uh, and so I started doing research I believe uh, my last semester at UIC as an undergraduate, and I did it all throughout that gap year. Uh, and you're also allowed to project your hours. Uh, so I was able to include even uh, extra research hours because you're allowed to project into the next application cycle or up until the next year. Um, well, regardless of, you know, I hope that that made sense, but um, that's what I did. Uh, I pretty much did research all that year. Uh, so then that way I can have different aspects of my application strengthened that I didn't have prior to that because I had no research prior to that. Uh, and so I basically, it was, well, by the time I applied, it was about two years worth of research and two years worth of uh, extracurricular activities, uh, except for some of these other ones that I had already been doing prior. Most of my uh, extracurriculars were about two, two or three years and some like four. Um, and that's the thing that's important as well when you do these things, like um, you want to make sure that the things that you do are things that you're passionate about. Uh, so don't force something that, you know, don't force something if you don't like it. There's so many different things that you could do for your uh, application. And it's, if you feel passionate about them, go for it. If you know if it's volunteering, you know, at, you know, at, at the shelter, like, and that's what you want to do, do that. 
because it, it comes out very genuine uh, during your interview when you talk about it. Uh, and that's one thing that I was complimented about when I was talking, when I was interviewed, is uh, that I was able to show that, you know, the things that I did, I was genuine and I had a passion about them because I did. Like, I chose some of these things. You know, I'm an ex-athlete. I played football since I was like 10 years old. And so for me, I, I just love doing that. So it wouldn't feel like, you know, an extra thing for me to do. I just enjoy doing it. And so it was very easy to talk about. Uh, and then commit to them. Obviously, you want to commit to them. You don't want to do like, you know, scattered here. Like I did, you know, I volunteered at this thing one day and then I volunteered that one. And then you have like 100 different things, but none of them are like long term. You want to have something that, you know, is long term so they can see that you're committed as well. Um, and so, again, nothing was really mentioned to me about it during my interview. Uh, most of it was really just about the typical why medicine, you know, and then you know, and then they just kind of let you talk about different things. Um, and then I believe UIC has the MMI, which I can talk about a little bit more if y'all want, but that's kind of generally what I did during my gap year. And that's probably what you want to do, use that opportunity to strengthen, you know, uh, different aspects of your application. Were you able to get any sort of publication out of your, um, your research? I, I was not actually, I, uh, I was close to getting a publication, but the results were just all over the place. So then it ended up not happening. It didn't match like what, cause I was uh, under, basically under the wing of a PhD student. So they kind of had a vision uh, and my results weren't matching what they were like, you know, what they were trying to do. And so it ended up working out, but I will say that I don't, I don't think that's, a, that's really uh, a detriment, you know, unless you're, you know, usually like there's certain schools and you can look that up on the MSAR. Uh, certain schools value research a lot more. Obviously, like, you know, if you're trying to get into like Northwestern, you know, Harvard or some things like that, you probably want a lot of like, you know, publications. Uh, but, you know, sorry, mid-tier MD schools, uh, you know, UIC, Loyola, like all, all different types of schools that are not like, you know, top 10, top 20. You don't need to be super research heavy. It helps a lot, don't get me wrong. Uh, but I wouldn't be too worried if you're not able to get like publications out of them. As long as you show commitment uh, to something, and commitment to research, uh, then you should be okay. Uh, but again, you know, it helps. And, and, and it's interesting because different things, uh, like you don't have to get like published in a journal either. Uh, if you present like at a conference, that's, a, that's technically considered a publication. Uh, you know, and you can put that on, on your application. Uh, even for med school, like, uh, you know, I'm doing research now for, uh, for orthopedic surgery, which is something that I'm interested in. And, uh, you know, I haven't gotten like, I'm waiting because it's such a long process to get published in a journal. But like I, I've done a, a lot of abstracts and things like that, uh, and so uh, that 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 counts for for our uh, residency application. So very similar process applying for medical school. Also, my son just got home from daycare, so if you hear some crying, that's going to be him. So just a fair warning. And um, during the process, when you were crafting out your fifteen experiences and your personal statement. Um, was there like a go-to person that you had at UIC that really helped you out? Um, as far, no, not really, because I actually didn't really like talk to too many pre-med advisors and, and things like that uh, uh, until like the moment I was already like applying. Uh, I really, uh, most of the information that I got and uh, I highly recommend everybody use as well is the uh, pre-med subreddit. Uh, do y'all know, have y'all, do y'all uh, visit it? Y'all know where it is? Okay, cool. Yeah, they have honestly amazing resources. Like, you know, you have people with multiple acceptances, like nine, 10 acceptances, top 20s, top 10s. And a lot of them are very, you know, uh, you know, they, they have the same approach that we probably all have. Like, you know, you, you get accepted and you want to help people. You know, you want to be like, you know what? I went through this process. I remember what it was like. I remember like the uncertainty and they like to have very similar approaches and they like to help out. And they post a lot of helper resources. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a very specific post from Reddit. Uh, I don't know if you all know the username. It's uh, I think it's like Arnold something, but he has a very well written, crafted, like write up about how to choose those different experiences and how to write them. I highly recommend you use, utilize it. That's what I use. And I think it helped tremendously because I was kind of last like, Okay, how do I go about approaching this? And they kind of give you, like, he kind of wrote out like stepwise. This is how you want to do this. Like for shadowing, you don't want to like talk about like, oh, during my shadowing experience, I had this like life-changing moment. Like, no, like you really just need to put like, okay, I shadowed this doctor for this and that and like this doctor for that for that many hours. That's pretty much it because shadowing isn't like something that like, I mean, we know that that's not, 
life changing that that's the reason not the reason or maybe some people did you know get into medicine but for the most part uh shattering you just want to make sure that that's what you want to do that's what it's for to for you to like uh you know uh see what medicine's like and be like okay this is something that i want to do so generally you know people only do like 40 20 40 hours of shattering that's usually enough uh and then when it comes to other sections like research if research was like you know well i guess i can talk about this a little bit they give you a character count um the way it works is that they give you like i believe i don't call me on this, but I think it's about 500, no, maybe 500 characters, not words, but characters for, per uh, section, activity section. And then they give you a thousand or to 1500 characters to write out like two areas that you felt were significant to you. So those are the ones that you wanna like spend the most time writing, create like not creatively, but the, you know, writing a lot about because they were significant to you and how they contributed to your interest in medicine and things like that. And I chose uh, writing about, uh, you know, I think I, uh, I wrote about football and I wrote about my research experience. Uh, and for a variety of different reasons, I chose those two and you can write a little bit more about them. So um, you wanna use those very, very like smartly and carefully because those are very important. And that's probably the ones they're gonna read the most anyway. Um, so yeah, so again, uh, there's a Reddit post about that. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's probably a Reddit post about uh, most of the questions that y'all uh, got. Um, so I think it's a very useful resource. Definitely utilize it. Obviously, take a lot of things with a grain of salt because, again, it is the internet and it's got its own drawbacks that you know any website has. Oh, and as far as personal statement, I really just kind of uh, wrote it myself, and I had like no, I, I had just had different people in different parts of my life look it over. So I had like you know my partner look it over. I had. Uh, you know, my, some of my family members look it over. I had other pre-med students look it over that knew, like, you know, what kind of like what a ministers committee wanted to hear. And then I also had a uh, uh, someone within like UIC, uh, Pierre. Pierre, I don't know if y'all uh, have ever met with Pierre from uh, Urban Health. Yeah, so, he, well, he helped me out. And it's just kind of someone that kind of knows the ins a little bit. And, you know, I kind of just took all, like it all and just trying to craft it something out of it because, you know, I obviously wanted someone that's, you know, in that knows a little bit about the admissions process. Also wanted someone, another pre-med to tell me like, what, you know, what do they think? I also wanted a family like, okay, is this, is this understandable? Like, does this, is this me? Like, is this a cohesive story? Like, you know, and then I made all my edits based on that. So that's kind of the approach I took for uh, my personal statement. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, what's up, yeah, um, why did you choose UIC uh, like for medical school anyway? Uh, so I, I'm going to sound super biased when it comes to this answer, but uh, I didn't mention it a little bit earlier, but I don't know if that was super clear. Uh, so UIC, it was a little bit of a tricky situation for me. I was going to apply to a lot of different schools and I had my school list all written out based on like MSR and based like on the ZM scores and stuff like that. Uh, but what ended up happening is uh, I found out uh, that I was going to be a dad and that my, I was going to have a son. And so I had to stay in the Chicago area and I couldn't really go anywhere else. And I knew that my best chance at getting into medical school was UIC because of the connection I had with it. Uh, you know, that, you know, I, I went there as an undergrad. I knew the patient population. I knew the mission of UIC and it matched very well with what I wanted to do when I practiced medicine. So I, I applied only to UIC. Uh, and luckily I got accepted to UIC, but it is something I do not recommend anybody does uh, because if I didn't get in, I would have nothing, I would have nothing, you know, uh, the, I strongly discourage anyone to do that. The, I only had to do that because of unforeseen circumstances, you know, it happens, uh, but I would recommend you apply to like, you know, if you apply for the, if you uh, qualify for the fee assistance program, apply to the max schools that that lets you and make sure they align with your statistics. Uh, and obviously with the mission that you, like, you know, what type of physician you want to be, uh, you got to make sure you align with their mission. Uh, and then on top of that, that's, so it's kind of like a little, it's kind of like a little bit of both. So to answer your question, I applied because I felt like I had a really strong match with the, with the mission of UIC. And because I thought it was my highest chance of getting into, cause I didn't, uh, I had to stay in Chicago and really could only apply to UIC. That's that. I couldn't go, you know, obviously couldn't go to like Michigan or like, you know, anywhere outside the country because I was about to have a son. But I really, really liked another thing about UIC is that they are a true pass fail curriculum. And my experience uh, with undergrad with UIC is that UIC is very supportive. 
especially for people of color. And I don't believe that is the case, obviously, for all their schools, but that was my experience. And I talked to other uh, USC med students, and they told me the same thing, that the administration is very supportive of their students. And that has 100% been my experience uh, throughout these last two years. So like I said, I got a son. And so sometimes he gets sick, and I can't go to class. And like, you know, I, I would feel very like, oh, man, I can't do this thing. And I, I talk to the administration, they're like, oh, of course, like, you know, you can make it up at this day that you don't, don't feel fear of force, like anything, any problem that I felt like I came across, the administration was 100% supportive, at least during the preclinical years. So that has been huge. And there's a lot of different, like, uh, you know, uh, mentors that they, they, you know, that they have here as well. I, I, overall, I just, I felt like it was just very supportive and it matched the experience that I had as an undergrad at UIC. And I cannot emphasize the pass fail curriculum enough. Most MD schools are transferring over to that, but I recommend you all, when you're applying, if you have that luxury to choose a school that's pass fail because it will make the first two years very, very, not easy, but not very, not stressful, I should say. Because, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not competing against other people to get a grade. If you pass, you pass. There's no, you know what I mean? There's no, it doesn't matter if you pass by half a point, you pass. And it doesn't look any different than someone that scored 99% on their exam. It looks the exact same. And so that's very helpful because then you can pretty much, you know, um, kind of just chill. <laughs> I feel like, I felt like, uh, I guess I, I could talk a little bit about my experience in med school if anybody's interested. I felt that uh, my experience, I feel like my experience in med school has been easier to an extent or more chill than what it was as an undergrad. Uh, and that probably has to do a lot with the fact that the school was one, pass fail, and two, that I wasn't working, you know, <laughs> like, 40 hours a week and going to school and trying to like do all these extra things. It's pretty much like your job, you know, you can kind of work in a nine to five, but studying. So, um, and so I felt like my experience at USC has been very chill so far. Probably the hard, the toughest part right now has been studying for step because I just, I, just, I gotta study, all, all, you know, all the time, but you know, that's gonna, that's obviously gonna pass too. And it's just part of it. Uh, so, so far my experience with med school has been pretty, pretty great, very supportive at UIC. Uh, and, you know, if UIC is not the school for you, you feel like maybe that's not where you want to go, it's, it's all good, you know, definitely go to a school that's pass fail and has, you feel like, you know, you talk to the students and, you know, they're currently there and if they feel like their support, the administration supports them, I would highly recommend you to go there. It's there. For sure, thank you. Yeah, of course. I don't know if y'all heard my son. <laughs> yeah, so, with somebody over there. Oh, sorry. That's okay. You can go ahead. Okay, oh, thanks, Jonathan. So, like, I was just gonna ask, like, how have you been, like, kind of balancing, like, your well, like, your work, you know, like, your school life and, like, your um, like, your home life, you know, like, how has that been for you? Uh, lately, it's been a little bit tough, but honestly, the first two years were uh, well, the first year was a uh, was a blessing because uh, I honestly owe everything to my partner. She's just been super supportive, like, and, and it was, you know, it was the pandemic, so we've kind of at home a lot, so it made things a little bit easier, but uh, she was very supportive and understanding, like, you know, from nine to five, I'm, I'm studying, you know, and that's just like, and then once I hit five o'clock, I'm like, okay, it's my turn, you know, I'll take over, watch, watch my son until he goes to bed, put him to bed, and then, you know, I chill in the afternoon, whatever, you know, do, you do, like, around eight or nine, fall asleep, and then I just chill and do my thing, uh, but the first year was really just a lot of uh, support from my partner and just being very understanding uh, of what, you know, what, what, what it, what my schedule entailed. Uh, and then the second year, uh, what ended up happening was uh, we ended up doing daycare. Uh, so doing daycare uh, made things a lot, a lot easier. So he's been going to daycare for like six months now uh, because, you know, he's basically in school. So he goes to daycare from like, you know, eight to like around five. And then once he, uh, what I usually do is like that time is just very disciplined study time. I need to get what I need to get done. So by the time my son comes from, from daycare, I got to take care of him, you know, help him put him to bed, you know, and all those things. So that's usually, that's the approach I took. And I find that, you know, even 10 to five, like 10 to three, even is, is more than enough time to, to study and pass your exams in med school. Uh, and that's really just because of like, uh, you know, again, uh, Reddit for me was very helpful because uh, I just kind of looked at a bunch of different posts of the, the different like study strategies that people took and they approached the, the way they approached med school. And I found the one that, that fit me and I applied that the moment I started and it was just very efficient. 
Uh, so really the thing about med school is uh, I don't I don't believe it's hard. Um, I think it's just it's a lot of work. But if you are efficient, like like conceptually, you know what I mean? Like if you're studying for the MCAT, you know, you've gone, gone through all these undergrad classes. It's really not that much different. Uh, I would even argue some of the conceptual things are tougher, like an undergrad. Uh, it's really just about you finding the way that you learn and learning how to be efficient with your studying because you get just a, a mass amount of material and obviously you can't. Sometimes the stra strategies that work for you in undergrad don't transfer over to you know med school. Uh, so that's kind of how I approached it. Uh, I pretty much use a bunch of Anki. That's, I live by Anki. But yeah, if anybody wants to know a little bit more about that, I can talk about that. Or if anybody has another, I think Jonathan, you had a question, right? Yeah, and I was just gonna ask, like, for example, I want to apply to med school. Is there something that, like, perhaps goes under the radar that you should, like, really look more into? Or do you feel like everything you've told us is sort of, like, you have to be alert in all things when applying to med school, if that makes say, sense? Say that again? My bad. I, I missed, I, I think you cut off during the last right, Yeah, I think my internet is, is bad. So I was asking, like, is there something that when you're applying to med school that can easily go oh, yeah, under the radar? Sure. Uh, I mean, you could type it out. Oh, no, I'll do it. Right. Let me go ahead and do it. Right? Yeah, bro. I mean, you cut it off like a lot. I, I barely caught like a word. My bad. I got a dip. Thank you for an insight. Hi, right, Zoe. Thanks for coming out, man. When applying for med school, is there something that goes under the radar? Uh, mm, I'm not sure if I understand that question. Like, oh, you mean like something that we should consider that maybe like strengthens the, our application or just, or, or what do you mean? Sorry. Mm. <sighs> Let me see. I think one thing that is, that I did find, uh, you know, that I feel like is important is, I mean, don't, you don't have to force it, but like, if you have like an activity section that's unique to you, like, and you know, it's like a unique thing and like you're passionate about it and it, you know, it ties into like your story. Uh, I think you should hundred percent highlight that. Like, you know, like, I, I know I've said this like a hundred times, but on the interview trail, like when I spot, like, you know, I don't think I've met many other people that were like, you know, ex football, like, you know, athletes that, uh, you know, there were coaches as well. So, and, and, and that's one of the things that when I was interviewing was again, like talked about and like, you know, highlighted for me. Uh, so I think like, if you have something that's unique, whether like, uh, I don't know, like maybe you, you know, you do singing, you know, like, I don't know, like something like that, something unique to you that's like, will make you stand out. That's not every like, cause for example, like, you know, uh, you know, working in the hospital or doing clinical work or like volunteering, like, you know, a lot, a lot of prima like or being you know part of like different like orgs or starting different orgs that's pretty common and a lot of other pre-meds like have that in fact the majority of them are going to have that and you know it's no not you know it's like if you have that that's great you know that's what they want you know you do those things obviously for a reason uh but if you have something that unique that you can highlight then i would try to like you know i, I would definitely do that in your like application try to highlight it and show you how, how you because they want to also know like you know like who you are as a person like you know not just like oh you know this the, this guy did or this guy this girl did the same thing that everybody else did you know sometimes that that, that can help your application so I, I don't know if like that answered your question but I do notice that like I have noticed I should say that that's one of the things if you could find like a very interesting thing and then you know apply it somehow to your to your story uh, I would do that again obviously don't you know don't, you don't have to force it either you know if you don't that's totally fine a lot of people get accepted and are not like unique and like you know and all these have these crazy stories you know i hope that i answered your question i don't i don't aside from that i can't really i have no other insight oh thanks yeah, man. that's what i was looking for yeah it looks like angel has to head out angel thanks for coming man all right, cool. Yeah, thanks for coming out. Um, yeah, I mean, if anybody has any other like specific questions, definitely, you know, feel free to ask. Uh, I do have a quick question. Why, why didn't you consider like Rush, Rosalind Franklin, or Loyola? Uh, yeah, so I actually was gonna apply to those schools, but again, like like I said, just because you know <laughs> I had a son in the way, I didn't. But 
I would say that I, I probably was leaning towards not applying uh, towards Rush uh, for many different reasons. Uh, I, I mean, I kind of heard they, they kind of have like a malignant culture, uh, but you know, I can't speak on that just because I, I'm not a med student there, but I, that's kind of what I've heard from other students. And then also like, I think that they have like a ridiculous amount of like uh, volunteer hours, I believe that they require. I, I remember that, that was pretty big and I'm sure it hasn't changed yet. Like, like to be considered like, I mean, we're talking over like a thousand something hours or something like that. Yep, that's, that's, that's the number we was throwing around when I was an undergrad too. So I'm sure that's probably gone up a little bit. So uh, I was gonna apply, but I do remember it kind of being like borderline with Rush for that reason. Uh, and Rosalind Franklin, I, I definitely was gonna apply, but you gotta remember the thing about Rosalind Franklin is that like, uh, if you look at the MSAR, they're a little bit like lower stats uh, and a lot of people, like they, they get actually a very high volume of applicants. Um, Sorry, I don't know if it's the exact same, but uh, I'm sure y'all can check the MSR, but I do remember seeing like the number of applicants was very high compared to the number of interviews and the number of matriculants that went into Rosalind Franklin. And I'm sure a lot of that had to do because of the stats. If you think about it, like someone from California who has a very tough time, you know, applying in California because just it's super competitive in California and they see like, you know, a school in Chicago that accepts, you know, out of state and then like a little bit lower stats, they're going to throw their application at that 100%. You know, and that's, that's kind of just the, the way it works. You're going to get a large number of volume of applications because, you know, a lot of different people are trying to get into like, quote unquote, a lower stat school because they have a better chance. And so statistically, it's, it makes it a little bit tougher, even though like the, 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 the grades and the MCAT and stuff like that reflect that it, you, may, you might think it's a little easier to get into, but just because of the sheer volume of applicants, I, I was a little bit iffy, but I was going to apply anyway, because, you know, why not? Uh, so, but really the reason why I didn't apply to any of those was just because uh, I had, I, I had, you know, like I said, I felt like UIC was my best chance just because of the mission of UIC and just uh, <clears throat> like what type of physician I wanted to be. For sure, for sure. Um, yeah, and if anybody's got any questions about what med school is like, definitely, like, if y'all want to know, that's cool, too. Oh, could you explain the process of, like, the MMIs? Like, I know, like, lots of schools are, like, lean towards that now instead of, like, the traditional uh, interview pathway. Yeah, it's, uh, at least for UIC, it was about, like, uh, I believe it was seven different interviewers, and you got five minutes per interview. And you just get asked like a very short answer in the and you just got to give you know you got to got to respond to it and it's it's a lot sometimes it's like ethical sometimes it's more of like uh for example one of the questions i had was like uh they say that the best i can't remember the exact question but it was something along the lines of like they say that the best the best medicine is not needing medicine at all or some something like that you know what i mean and so obviously they were talking about preventative medicine because they're saying like it's better it's way better to cut off a disease before it gets really bad than to just give someone like, you know, a drug to make them feel better when they're already sick. So it was something like that. So you have to like kind of think on your feet and be like, oh, okay, yeah, I agree with that. And like, well, why do you agree with that? Well, I agree with that because like so-and-so, so, you know, you talk about preventive medicine, uh, you know, and some of the stuff were, they were that's kind of how they ask you. And some of the stuff were like ethical situations where like, oh, you witnessed this, like, you know, what would you do? Uh, and then I think another question was like, I think one interviewer straight up asked me like uh, something like med school is like tough or something like that. Like, how are you going to change like your study habits or something like that? And like to to like, what are you going to do to make sure that you succeed or something like that? And then you just got to give like an answer for like five minutes. So some of them are a little bit tough, but uh, a lot of the times like, you know, uh, you, they were kind of like straightforward what you're looking for. And you just got to, as long as you give a, a good answer, that's like, uh, I don't know, like kind of tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, then you, sh you should be okay. They're, they're not super bad, but again, I only experienced them at UIC. I have heard some other schools can be a little bit more ridiculous. So um, I can't really speak on those. Um, but yeah, they were about like, uh, you, were in, you were in a different like cubicle and you just go, just walk around five minutes and then everybody rotates and stuff like that. It wasn't too bad. Um, how do rotations work? How are you mentally preparing for them? And what are you looking into to do specifically for the last two years. Uh, okay, so uh, Jesse asked that question. So it's a little bit weird. And honestly, I, I probably won't be able to explain it too well, uh, the process of it, but you know, I can give you like the basics. They have like, it's really weird. I, I honestly was confused. A lot of us were just confused as they were assigning rotations, but essentially what it is, it's a lottery process. 
uh, there's called, something called like a track. Basically, you're assigned like an order of different specialties. So one track might be surgery first, internal medicine next, neurology next, obstetric gynecology. Another track might be the completely opposite. It might be, you know, neurology first, surgery next, obstetrics next, pediatrics, you know, and take all these different like quote unquote tracks that basically are just different orders of uh, the different rotations that you're going to do. And all the, uh, I believe the rotations are pediatrics, neurology, surgery, internal medicine, obstetrics and gynecology, uh, family medicine. And I think that is it. And you get an elective, but you can do whatever you want. Uh, so uh, surgery and internal medicine are a month and a half. They're known to be the most brutal of all the different rotations. Uh, they're probably about like 60 to even 70. I've seen 80 work weeks kind of. And you got to study on top of that. So it's very rough, especially surgery. It, I've heard it's very, very rough. If you get, especially if like, you know, so, the, so that's the way it works. The first two years, like you're in the, you're, you're like the, you're like the babies, at least at UIC of the, of the administration. Like they'll, they'll support you at least at UIC as much as they can during your preclinical years because they control all that. You know, it's all exams. They, they administer the exams and things like that. You know, it's their teachers teaching, they choose whatever. But when it comes to like rotations, yeah. That pretty much that goes out the window just because like you got to go to so many different hospitals in the city like Cook County and stuff like that and they have all these different schools coming over they don't really care about USC students they're not going to treat you any different than any other student and sometimes you might get like a malignant doctor that like you know it's going to yell at you or some shit like that you know so well, I mean my bad but, <laughs> but but you know so that's that's a little bit the way it works at least for rotations uh, and you rotate at different hospitals uh, there's like a list of like about 30 uh in from different all from different like specialties uh and the way it works is like you choose whatever track you want to do but there's no guarantee you're going to get it it's a lottery they're like hey i want this track to start for surgery and internal medicine first i like that i want to get the hard ones out the way first okay cool like choose that as your priority but you might not get it they do a straight up lottery roll the dice and you, whatever track you get that's the track you get after that after they, they figure out what like what the order that you're going to do your different rotations in they do another lottery to determine what's the location that you're gonna go to. Are you gonna stay at UIC for, I don't know, obstetrics? Are you gonna go to, you know, Mount Sinai? Are you gonna go out in like 95th Street and like, you know, Cicero to go do a rotation out there, which that you have, you know, if you get chosen there, you kind of have to uh, go there. Uh, and that's just, that's kind of the way it works. Um, what am I doing to prepare for them? I'm actually studying very hard for STEP. Uh, even though it's pass fail currently, and it's going to be pass fail for all y'all now, before I used to get a score, not anymore. I'm studying very hard for step because I want to make sure that I have like the foundation and my, of like what I need, like all the, you know, all the didactics and like all the book stuff. I want to make sure I know it well enough. So when I go into like, you know, to my rotations, I can actually carry out some of the theory, which is completely different than a real person, obviously. But it's going to be a lot tougher if I don't know, like, you know, if I don't have a strong foundation and I got to relearn that while in rotations, while you're working like a 60 hour work week, you know, that's going to make it even tougher. So I'm kind of grinding it out right now during step to like, you know, uh, you need 196 to pass. Uh, I'm trying to like, you know, do this. I'm trying to take approach it as if like I'm going to get an exam score because one, I obviously don't want to fail. <laughs> and then two, I also like want to make sure that I have, I'm, I'm, pre I'm as prepared as possible for rotation. So it's less work. Uh, and then during rotations, you have a shelf exam at the end of each rotation. So there's a shelf exam at the end of surgery, at the end of IM, at the end of neurology. They're called shelf exams. They're really just an exam that everybody in the country takes, and you get a certain percentile. And if you want to be competitive for, like, I don't know, like plastic surgery, orthopedics, dermatology, and stuff like that, you generally want to do well in those and do well in your rotations. So, um, and all of those build off step one material, the stuff that you learned the first two years. So it's pretty important to like try to do good uh, during the first two years. But if, if you feel like you don't want to go into a competitive specialty, like you can pretty much just chill as long as like you, you feel comfortable enough to pass. Uh, mentally, I don't even know yet uh, what I'm doing mentally. For, uh, I, I mean, like I said, I'm just preparing. Uh, hopefully it works out. I get a month before like rotation start after step. So my step exam is the 21st of March. And then uh, we don't start rotations till like the 28th of April. So we get like a month of like, they prepare you, they put you in like these situations where like someone's like life and death and stuff like that. And you gotta, you know, you gotta like act it out. Like, what are you gonna do? Also uh, do stuff like that to prepare you, but it's generally pretty chill. So I'm gonna try to like, just try to relax most of that time because after that it's gonna be nonstop grind.
Uh, and what I'm looking to do specifically for the next two years, well, the third year, there's really not much control you have over it. If you're like super like ambitious, you can do research potentially. Uh, I'm probably gonna wait towards like the end of uh, my third year because that's when my rotations get really chill. And if I'm still interested in orthopedics, I'm probably gonna do a little bit of uh, research in orthopedics to try to publish as much as I can. Ah, uh, bueno. Freddie, thank you so much for coming on, man. We really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Uh, and like I said, if anybody has like any specific questions or just wants to reach out to me to like email, whatever, it's definitely, definitely just shoot an email. I can send you over, uh, over that document uh, that I was talking about as far as MCAT. I can, you know, I can post as many links as possible of as far as like what a timeline is looking like, you know, like what to use when you're applying, like Interfolio and all these things that you might uh, have heard of it. So definitely feel free to reach out to me. I'm definitely willing to help. Perfect. And your email is fjacom2 at UIC? Yep. Um, yep, that's it. Okay, great. All right, cool. All right. Uh, it was great to see everybody. Man, it was great to see you again, Juan. Uh, yeah, likewise. So super awesome that y'all are doing this. Uh, and, you know, if you ever need anything, just let me know. I'm going to get back to some step studying. So, luck, I'm going to be miserable for a couple more hours. No, you got this. You got this, man. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, of course. Hi, right, everybody. I'll see y'all. Bye. Bye. Yeah, of course.